Okay, welcome back to um, our next hour on um, the lesson on crucifying the flesh. The uh, last hour we started off on laying the axe to the root and we've, uh, we've been partially through a few manifestations of the flesh, which is of the self, that is, we looked at selfish um, ambition and uh, we, we also did look at... Uh, self uh, sorry selfish ambition and self promotion now we're looking into the uh, next one a couple more to go before we move into the next is um how do we uh, the the understanding or the or what we do in depending dependence self dependence or um uh choosing to rely on our own abilities or our own strengths our own <clears throat> knowledge our own experiences rather than depending on the holy spirit so it is self dependence is where you rely on that which is your own or maybe on um, uh, or, or your own abilities rather than depending on on god and we see that um, uh, uh, very often that uh, we may operate in things that are because of our own abilities or our own understanding, but we see that none of them have the permanence. That without God, we know that we can do nothing. And uh, it is uh, often our abilities will, will very soon fall short. And uh, uh, we may think we can do it in our own strength or our own abilities, but without the Lord's hand in it, or without the Lord's spirit in it, there isn't much of a significance in, in the things we do, because there is no um, permanence, or, the, or, or, the, or there is no eternity into it, that it is not done with eternity in mind. There is no eternal permanence that we see. So that point of, uh, ha of being reliant on God, uh, we see that in uh, in the scripture in John 14, 4 and 5. It says, Abide in me and I in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So it's only if we want, if we are do if we want to do it with uh, keeping uh, the will and the glory of God in mind, it has permanence only when we do it completely relying on him yes he uses some of the abilities and our skills and our giftings that he's given us he uses it but your reliance is not on that but on the power of the holy spirit do we need to be diligent in exercising uh, whatever gifting that we've been given I'm sorry, I think I got cut off for a second. Am I back? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so if our, if our self-preservation takes importance more than what God has called us to do in our lives, um, and that will keep us from walking in obedience, which means we are probably at a, uh, a, a very 
a dangerous place spiritually. We're in a dangerous position spiritually. And this becomes a manifestation of the, of the self. And this is something that needs to be uh, um, handled or, or, you know, arrest very, very severely. When we want to preserve our lives uh, or our position or our name or our reputation at the expense of obeying God or being, or when we are unwilling to step out in what God wants us to do, it becomes an indication that our, we as ourselves and what we want is still predominantly important uh, in us. And I think one of the examples that I that I probably want to bring up is, um, uh, you know, when we're talking about self-preservation uh, is, let's say, uh, you know, when, when you are, when you've been, when you're speaking a word or when you are, let's say, prophesying over somebody um, with the, the fear and we, we are called to operate in faith. Of course, we are also called to operate in wisdom and uh, we we need to operate in knowing that, uh, you know, God wants us to completely rely and depend on the power of the Holy Spirit when we are um, maybe saying a word or bringing about some kind of a, uh, of, of a knowledge to other people. So to be able to, to do that and not come to a place of protecting ourselves, but being able to step out in faith, even though um, you, know, you feel a sense of, uh, you know, if I do this, what's going to happen to me? How will I sound like? Or, you know, how are people going to view me? Uh, all of that brings about, um, you know, that we are a lot more dependent on, on what, what we've, we've thought of. So when we desire to self-preserve, uh, we are preserving our lives at the expense of what God would want us to do or at the expense of obeying God. And that will definitely keep us from being fruitful for God's kingdom. It's only when you really die to yourself that we will be fruitful. So we are to be totally dependent on the Holy Spirit, you know, laying our reputation, maybe our position on the line. Because, uh, yes, you know, when we make a mistake, we do stand the risk of being labeled as something who, who is false or who doesn't have it accurate. However, it in definitely give, uh, takes faith for us to lay that aside and to step out and to flow in the Holy Spirit. It takes faith to allow the gifts that God has given us and, and um, use that to minister to the needs of people. So it is necessary to die to yourself, to flow in the Spirit. So the tendency to self-preserve will limit what the Holy Spirit desires to do. Okay? And, and I think this is something that we really need to continuously keep examining of ourselves, of, uh, of the faith that we put in, in the Holy Spirit, as, as we, especially as we, we may be ministering to God. Another part of uh, uh, a manifestation of the self is self-humiliation. The, the, uh, the need to appear humble, Okay. Yes, of course, being humble is absolutely essential, but there is this form of humility that may look very much like true humility, but is born so much out of, out of the flesh, out of the self. And this is what is termed as the self-humility, a feeling that, you know, that we may need to constantly put ourselves down, constantly put ourselves to a meager feeling of who we are so we they and sometimes it is it is a you know it generates a sense of feeling good when you talk low about yourself about being inferior or about not being worthy they kind of feel uh, uh, good that they feel bad okay and this is the humility that uh, that that we're talking about the self humility that we think so for example when we are maybe there is something that we are complimented for okay uh, also having uh, the grace to to uh, to be able to take whatever the compliment is given receiving the compliment and of course being able to 
um, pass, uh, even being able to give God the glory rather than denying that you can even do something. Okay, that's what is called as false humility. That means there is your that there is a need for for a sense of boosting. Someone needs to boost your self-esteem. So the right way to be to respond is to be able to take the compliment up graciously while yet giving the glory that is due unto God. So we need to be aware that everything that we do, our, uh, our ability and our efficiency, our sufficiency, everything is that which comes from God. And we don't put up a pretense of humility where we are failing to acknowledge all that God has given to us. Okay, and if we see that, you know, Paul was one person who really spoke very boldly that he was called by God to be a minister. Okay, now it says that you know, he even boasted of the of these things I boast. He boasted of the things that the Lord had done through him. So he did not walk through a false uh, a sense of humility. So when we look at this entire portion of self, we are called to die to ourselves. And I just want to bring up one verse, which is in Galatians 2.20, and I'll read that out for you. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by him, in the by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So as Christians or as believers, we no longer live for ourselves. We live for God who loved us, died for us, and it is Christ who lives in us. And that's what becomes the foundation. This means we're willing to lay aside all the things of those selfish desires of the flesh, those uh, ambitions, the, the way that we may want to promote ourselves, the way that we feel reliant or protective of ourselves, or even that humility. And we choose to do things that only the Lord would want us to do. And this is a daily, um, you know, this is a daily practice. We need to die daily, live, uh, live dying to ourselves daily. Um, and every day, it's something that we come by to be able to die to ourselves over and over and over so that, you know, we can continue to be in a place where we glorify God. OK, so that's the first one of um, uh, laying the axe to the root of self. We will move into the next one, which is jealousy. Is there any any anyone has any specific question? Um, uh, or any any? observations or any thoughts or any testimony that you all would like to bring up before we get into the the second one of laying the axe to the root of jealousy. Okay. All right. So we will move to the next one, laying the axe to the root of jealousy. Again, another part of the flesh that uh, that gets manifested. So we see a, a, a word for jealousy often mentioned in the Bible is the word envy. Okay, and uh, this is something that is very dangerous to us, uh, and we often do not realize how uh, intensely serious this can be, and we often may look at it just as a personality trait but it is something that needs to be dealt with. We, uh, we want to understand that jealousy, jealousy um, as it is, was written in Galatians 5, 19, 21, we looked at that word, it clearly talks, it, it talks about jealousies. And, um, you know, it's saying that people who are jealous do not inherit the kingdom of God. So uh, this is mentioned in that scripture, Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And uh, we, we, uh, we, we see that it states that if we continue in it, we, we have a problem. We have a serious issue and that's something that we need to, to, to work with. Now, jealousy can happen in very many areas of our lives. And, uh, you know, it can happen between siblings. It can happen between ministers. It can happen between churches. It can happen within families, between husbands and wives, between friends. Um, it, it is something that definitely requires to be held, to be dealt with. In fact, uh, Paul addresses this to the Corinthian church and he says that, you know, that um, 
he talks about uh, where there is envy and strife and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? And he was talking to believers there. He was talking to Christians there. And there was carnality in, in sense of envy and jealousy among them. And they were still being ruled by the flesh. So this is something that was there even in Paul's time where uh, people worked and dealt with jealousy. We see a lot of uh, instances of jealousy even in the Bible. You know, there are a lot of examples that are given where, um, where you see because of the jealousy that was involved, what it led to. For example, Joseph and his brothers, his brothers being jealous of, of Joseph, that he was being the favored child. And um, because his father displayed that favoritism and partiality, it bred that jealousy among the siblings, among his brothers. And uh, you see that how you know they plotted to kill him. They sold him off uh, and uh, uh, you know, finally sold him off uh, uh, to, to, the, to the merchants of Egypt. So you see what jealousy can do. We see that in Cain and Abel, that the jealousy that came about in, in Cain led him to murder his own his own brother. We see jealousy seen in uh, Saul and David, where uh, Saul becomes uh, so filled with envy because of the kind of um, accolades that he was he was getting from the people, and where where, uh, where where David was exalted and his praise was sung. We see that uh, David started, uh, sorry, Saul started to. Um, have a bitterness in his heart and uh, again plotted so many times to put David to death in in different ways so we see um, and and we see how how also David saw this and you know uh, behaved wisely by not retaliating or feeling the need to 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 throw revenge you know even though he may have sounded justified we see that how careful he was in in not allowing jealousy to take root okay so it is important for um, even for us to um, uh, uh, first of all admit that there is jealousy in our hearts when we try to conceal jealousy we are living in denial and that brings us to a place of not coming in terms with it and also being in a place of repentance. So if we live in a place of denial and do not agree that we are jealous about somebody, about something, maybe people in our own homes itself, it, it really closes the door for God to intervene um, in our lives and help us through that. So the first and foremost thing before we deal with jealousy is to know that we we cannot conceal it. We cannot be in a place of denying it, but we need to be open and recognize that it's there. So in the next half now, we'll just look at some manifestations of jealousy. What, what happens in jealousy? We see that um, jealousy can lead to murder. Okay. We, we spoke about that example and we, we see how, you know, Cain has mur had murdered uh, Abel because of jealousy. And we may be quick to say that, you know, okay, that was in Cain and Abel's time, but, you know, looking at ourselves, you know, uh, we, we know better or we are wiser to think that our, our jealousy will never treat us to uh, get us to murder somebody okay but if we read in Matthew 5 21 and 22 let's look at those verses and and then we will have you know a better perspective of what uh, it also also has to say so Matthew 5 21 to 22 uh, it says you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment but what does the New Testament law say it says that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in the danger of hellfire. And again, in 1 John 3.15, it says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Okay, so Jesus just said, even if you are angry, it is uh, angry at someone, you are the same as being a murderer. When you hate someone, you are being a murderer. So it, it talks about uh, how your, your jealousy builds it up in such a way that you are ready to murder and that, that intense anger in itself is something that is, is sin. 
as scripture has shown. So one of the manifestations of jealousy we see is murder. The, uh, the next one we see is anger outbursts, okay? Being, um, being in a place of, of seething anger. Now, uh, often, uh, and, and, and the context that we generally look at, you know, when we look at jealousy is, uh, um, and, and uh, one of the verses here is in Proverbs 6.34, it says, For jealousy is a husband's fury, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. Now, although this is the context of a wife uh, or a spouse having committed adultery and um, the, the husband is very furious, um, jealousy is what, what has provoked the husband to wrath, you know, spare in the day of vengeance. So there may be circumstances where jealousy provokes other emotions and usually an outburst of anger. So it is uh, an outburst of anger can be the root of jealousy. So we need to examine ourselves concerning the anger we may have towards somebody else. And the root of these outbursts is probably jealousy in itself. And this is generally, it, it, this jealousy can be fueled by anything. You know, it can be uh, fueled because of a feeling of inferior, inferiority or a, or a feeling of um, uh, not being good enough. Uh, so, so we do see that um, th that's something that need, needs to be addressed. That even, um, uh, you know, even in situations, especially maybe in our situations at home, okay, to really know how is it, what is it that we're seething inside, because it really, it really manifests itself in its behavior when we are with our spouses and with our children or with our brothers or siblings, uh, how our jealousy may, may manifest. So the second one we, we looked at is uh, wrath, uh, uh, outbursts of wrath or outbursts of anger. The third is seeking revenge. When there is jealousy, we, we look for a place to seek revenge. And I'll read Romans 12, 19 <clears throat> to 21. It says, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Um, uh, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay, so scripture shows us that we do not give back evil for evil but to pursue that which is good or good for, for all. So we may, uh, and, and there may be different ways in which we resort to, uh, to this revenge. It may not be very active, but it can be quite passive in itself. You know, it, it may not be overtly revengeful, but it can be something that is very quietly done. Even when, um, you know, uh, even in, in our speech, it can come, Mm, uh, the way that we we respond to someone, maybe in sarcastic terms, when we when we say something, or in our refusal to do something for the other. So the kind of behavior that we manifest can be quite subtle, but uh, which 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 shows a very a retaliation that is very quiet and may seem very uh, uh, that that doesn't seem harmful. But it it is it is uh, caused to to administer that sense of anger or revenge. Okay, so the root cause of revengeful behavior is one again that we see is jealousy. <clears throat> the other manifestation that we see is resentment. Okay, so if anger, <clears throat> um, if we see that anger is bad, we know that jealousy can be just as bad. Because when being unkind or resentful towards others can definitely be due to jealousy also. And uh, we see a verse in Proverbs 27, 4, it says, Wrath is cruel and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy? So in this verse, it says, you know, wrath and anger are bad enough, but uh, jealousy can be really, really bad. So it is really cruel. Jealousy is cruel. So maybe even our wrong and unkind behavior or words to others can be due to jealousy. Like I said, sarcastic remarks. So we're not just trying to change the behavior. It's not just not trying to bandage it to bring up good words or pleasant words, but to deal with the root cause um, that is in our heart. So the root cause of unkindness also can be jealousy. The other one that we see is division. 
where there are many divisions that are caused because one person had jealousy in the heart. And, uh, you know, and this is what we see often in, in families where, uh, again, the example that is best seen in the Bible in scripture is, um, uh, is with Joseph, how there was a division or there was a complete pushing off of Joseph from the rest of them. You see that the 11 of them ganged up together against, I mean, the 10 of them ganged up together as, uh, against uh, um, Joseph. Okay? And we see that very predominantly happening here where, you know, especially when, um, when th there is probably some form of partiality or favoritism shown uh, among the children, the kind of division that takes place, you know, people, uh, even in counseling, I've, I've had so many people come with the, um, with anger towards their siblings or a difficult relationship with their siblings because of the kind of favoritism that the parents showed and because of the root of uh, root of envy or jealousy that had been had been in their hearts and the kind of uh, division that had caused a difficulty in their relationships so we see that uh, jealousy can also be can manifest itself out in in strife uh, that ends up in division where there is no togetherness uh, in a family or or in a uh, in a group the next uh, manifestation we see is competitiveness this uh, we so when we look at competition we know that there is uh, there is a place for healthy competition and when it is done well or it is uh, in the right place it is healthy uh, because we and you will see this competition in different places like maybe in the exam hall or in a sports field uh, it is important that you know everyone does their best and uh, and think about success but not the kind of competition that um, that creates havoc and not the kind that we will want to see in the in in god's kingdom okay often we begin to um, we see believers also beginning to compete with each other, um, even with regard to their spiritual lives. Okay, what you see on the outside world of how people compete with one another for a bigger house or a bigger car or a bigger name or children being in in good colleges. Okay, bringing that up into into the kingdom of God or into the church itself is is again. Uh, you know, a, a, a very sad and dangerous thing. Okay, maybe one. Uh, you will see within the church they want somebody wanting to do bigger than the other. So this extreme levels of competitiveness, even in the spiritual uh, uh, world, in the spiritual uh, growth, in spiritual maturity or growth, can drive to um, pursue some wrong goals also. Okay, and this is not pleasing in God's eyes because we see that there again these are motivated by jealousy. The next we see is uh, strife and contentions where hatred or jealousy or uh, envy just builds up uh, trouble or builds up strife, builds up difficulty in relationships. Or there can be um, insecurity that comes up or isol in isolation that comes up. So jealousy creates that insecurity and tends to um, tends for people who who is harboring that root of jealousy to keep to themselves, okay, to uh, to uh, just keep themselves away from 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 uh, others because of their insecurity, and we see that um, you know sometimes we've also seen that of how there can be ministers of God who let their congregation know to keep themselves away from other ministers or ministries um, or even from other believers because of the insecurity that is stemming from within them. Uh, and we see that as people of God, everyone should be given the liberty to receive from others also, from other fellowships, from other church, from other ministries, um, you know, and uh, from other from other uh, places who really speak the word of God and and help in your spiritual growth. So th that's the freedom that you give them and not uh, bring them to a place of, um, uh, because of that insecurity, wanting them to operate only in their ministry. The next thing we see in uh, jealousy, another manifestation we see is uh, overprotection. 
So sometimes uh, what can come as a genuine concern is like, you know, being overprotective is could probably because of jealousy. Like this, this is often seen in, uh, um, you know, in homes where maybe one of the spouses uh, uh, is probably jealous of the other's uh, uh, skill and build up that they, they kind of in the pretext of being overprotective, they would want them to just stay at home and maybe not work or, um, you know, not do anything that, uh, um, that, 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 that may be better off than the husband, the husband or the other spouse. So this could, this overprotectiveness again is something that really can come from, uh, the, from, from within jealousy. And uh, this also comes because of that insecurity. So insecurity is also is something that can be manifested as a result of that uh, that uh, jealousy, okay? Or um, or certain certain uh, certain things that often get thrown out of proportion because of of uh, the root cause being jealousy. So we understand and know that jealousy, if allowed to breed in our uh, our hearts can have very severe consequences. Our jealousy can be very destructive, that it can bring not hurt just to ourselves, but it can bring hurt to our relationships. It can be uh, hurtful to um, another person's life, another person's um, work. Jealousy can definitely affect our own health. It can, it can keep us away from doing what God wants us to do. Our uh, focus and our vision become so blurred that we get distracted from following what God wants us to do as against following what we want to do to make our, our work much better than the other. So it can blind us from what God's true vision is for our lives. Jealousy can uh, blind us again from seeing what God wants us to see. Okay, sometimes because of our jealousy, uh, we, we don't recognize what God is, God is attempting to show us. Jealousy can also cause a lot of trouble. It can open the door to even demonic work. It opens the door to confusion and every demonic work. And these are things that we need to get rid of. So it is a serious issue. It's something that affects us. It affects uh, our ministries, it affects our maturity in Christ, it affects our vision uh, in knowing what is what is right to do, and it also opens the door for every kind of activity, every kind of demonic activity. So what do we do to get rid of our jealousy is first and foremost is to repent, is to uh, first is to recognize it, to repent of it, and to, uh, as scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, 14, is to walk in love because we see that as believers, we can only walk in the love of God because the love of God is that which is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And it's only God's love that can take away the, these jealous feelings. So coming to a place and walking in God's love will keep that jealousy out of our hearts. It is to rejoice in the blessings of others. When, when others are going through something good, to be able to rejoice with them, you know, it says rejoice, with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. So to be able to rejoice and and give thanks to God for whatever you are seeing that is beneficial to to others. <clears throat> and uh, the other one to know is to be able to see whatever from the way God sees it. Is to know that you know when God does uh, improve somebody else's or, or when when there is let's say success or prosperity or. Now, uh, uh, growth happening in somebody else's life to see things from God's perspective that, you know, God works th through each one of us in a very different manner. And he wants us to be vessels that are willing to have him work through us. So coming again, then coming to a place of repentance, renouncing the jealousy and coming to asking God to fill our hearts and our minds with his word that will completely uh, uh, work and help and and work us through. Okay, uh, so we also we looked at these two um, points of this of self and jealousy, and uh, we have around I think we're around ten minutes, um, and I just stop here for questions and uh, take up the other two uh, and finish that entire lesson on crucifying the flesh next week. So just stopping here for either some testimonies, some observations, some thoughts 
or even some questions. Okay, so someone's asked a question. Uh, how do we deal with a short-tempered person? Sometimes it's so hard to discuss or speak with them, even small things, because they don't try to understand things and they always overtake your uh, words and make you think that you are wrong. Okay, all right. So um, <clears throat> when somebody is short-tempered, when somebody is angry, um, a good thing to do at that point, now these are, this is a more a practical advice, okay, than from a scripture or verse, is to, um, uh, you know, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Now, and how would I take that is when someone is responding to me in a bad temper, there is a, a tendency for me to be aroused in anger just as much okay and there's a clear instruction of in your anger do not sin so when there's someone who has a bad temper it's it's wisdom to step back and step back and just uh, let the person calm down cool down before the matter can be addressed once again okay talking to someone who is angry is like talking to a drunk man okay especially someone who cannot control his does not have judgment to control his words okay? so the best thing to do is not to completely go ahead and provoke the anger much more than what it is but to step back it protects you and it protects the other person so to be able to step back and give it a couple of minutes of uh, calming yourself down before the matter can be addressed. And this is something we commonly see among husbands and wives, right? When they are having an argument, one goes, one says 10%, the other takes it to 15, then it goes back to 20, then it goes to 40, then it goes to 80 till you reach 100 and there is havoc happening. Wisdom is be, uh, in your anger, do not sin. Step back, step back and say, maybe say, you know, I don't think we can have much of a conversation when we are upset and angry. Let's um, let's reconnect at a later time to talk about it. So that is a wise way of doing it. That whenever you are, even even we we are not just in anger, but let's say in an emotion where there is intense sadness. Okay, you you step back because in your intense moments of anger or sadness is when you take impulsive decisions. You may take decisions that are not well thought of, okay, and comes because of your anger. And we see, I think the common example that we see is that when couples fight, words that are not meant to edify come out, you know, that it can be words of doom, it can be words of separation, it can be words like divorce that come out that, that are not meant to be, um, uh, that, that come out very impulsively but cannot be taken back. So the wisest thing to do is step back, wait for them to come, for you to come before you can address the situation again. I hope I answered your question, Abhinas. Okay. Anybody else has any other questions or thoughts or? Okay, there's another question. How is jealousy in churches dealt with when uh, slandering happens. Are senior pastors from some churches called upon to mediate and help to resolve? Some other religions have a senior council who will help in these matters. Okay, so when uh, let's say this jealousy noted, that's why it's always better to have a team, uh, like a like like you rightly said, a certain council, a senior council who will help in these matters. And uh, it, it's, it's not just a member of a two, three team, but a larger member who are able to sit together and address 
um, these 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 issues. Um, uh, I'm I'm not sure about senior pastors from other churches being called upon to mediate. Well, I guess that may happen when, let's say, the senior pastors uh, are involved in this uh, in the slandering and the jealousy that happens. Uh, you know, someone with with a high sense of authority is probably bought by. But uh, in uh, like, for example, in as part of our church at APC, where there is a team where one where everyone seems accountable to another, uh, not just there's not um, you know everyone. All all the pastors in in the team are accountable to one another and have the capacity, the ability to bring up um, certain certain points of notice and bringing it up for addressal. So uh, that's why it's, uh, you know, it's always better to have a team together in a church working together so that there is always an accountability and also a one-on-one -on -one, uh, learning and help um, through pastorship or through, through them holding on the positions of leadership. I think your question was basically meant how is lead jealousy in in leadership in church leadership dealt with? Yeah, I think that's what. Uh, no, actually, uh, I was mentioning more. Uh, you know, in in say for example, in a congregation, in a city, for example, like in like Bangalore, for example, and there are some churches that you know are uh, you know have come you know into uh, oh. you know where there is. Um, you know, it goes through the press, and you know there is this level of this, this slandering, and you know, um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I think there are uh, you know some religions, uh, other religions who have like you know a, a, a council, senior council, yeah, a senior mm -hmm. council mm -hmm. who can you know sort of mediate in these matters, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. then maybe mm. because of the different denominations i don't know whether they mm. have that in, in, the, in you know in christian christian uh, mm. yeah. yeah i'm sorry christopher i don't know if i I'm, i don't think i know the answer to that and maybe we'll i'll bring this up uh, we could probably bring this up at the uh or may I, I can check on this and get back i'm not too sure about if there is anything like this okay you're saying church interchurch jealousy okay all right okay so I'll, I've taken that question and probably addressed that. Yeah. Uh, any other question? If not, we can just close with a word of prayer. OK, may I call upon any one of the students to, to close in prayer? Anybody who can? Anybody? Pastor, can I pray? Yes, Shri Kumar, go ahead. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day which you have given to us, O God. We give you all the glory, honor, and praises, Father God. Every word which we have heard from your servant, O God, I pray that, Father, those things are, Father God, which we have to deal personally. And we pray that give us the grace to identify our, our weaknesses, identify our 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 those areas where Lord Master enemy is holding, oh Father God, which is not allowing us to move further, oh God, which is not allowing us to grow spiritually, grow, grow the way how you want us to grow, or which is not allowing us to become fruitful, oh Father. Today I'm asking you, Father, to each one of us, for each one of us, give us that grace, oh Father. Let these words, what we learn today, Father, let we deeply, Lord Master. Take it in our heart, in our spirit, of oh Father, and let we practically work on these things. Let we repent on the every every areas, of oh Father, where where the enemy has enemy has targeted our life, of oh Father God. We ask you, Holy Spirit, your grace more and more flow in us, so that we can be more fruitful. Let these sins, let these let these small small Lord Master, the, the the small foxes, let it not corrupt our walk with you, Father, so that we can able to finish our race which is given unto us. We humble ourselves before you, and we thank you for your servant, O oh God, Master, for strengthening her. We give you all the glory, honor, and praises in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shrikumar. Thank you, everybody. God Thank bless. You.
Thank you all. We'll meet next week. God bless. Have a blessed week ahead. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you too. Thank you.